Chapter 4 Pirates and Mousewives Any beast who dares not move dies here! All sail ahead. Off the shorelines close to the northern cliffs of Fallen Peak Highlands was a large old trade ship with three masts, about three full sails tall, cutting through the waves of the tempestuous sea. Its sides were paired with round Viking shields and rows of oars below them. Red and white striped sailcloths were strung from its spars, partially torn and stained, with the lettering of her name poorly repainted onto the tar-stained wooden hull. Loch Fola was the ship's new name, and any who knew it knew to steer clear of her wake. The captain and crew were preparing her to endure an ever-changing looming form of black currents in the heavens, with the heavy curtains of a great deluge hanging in suspense. The raging tempest blew forcefully as razor-like mists raced by, and waves taller than mountains threatened to wash the ship against the cliffside. The sound of ocean crescendos bellowed as they thrashed into the hull, causing it to creak and groan arduously. The sailcloths, bursting full, pulled hard on the mast, causing the rigging to rattle and clang about under taut ropes. Skaglar, his sea rat horde, and the slave crew were just audible through the humongous waves of sound, cursing the sea for some and uttering prayers for others. The crusty marmot captain was wailing commands from the wheelhouse where the helm was located as sea spray washed across his visage. He was clothed in a long tan hide jacket worn with time, with a knitted red and green kilt torn and fringed at the bottom and heavy brass earrings. A golden fang was stuck in his lower jaw that would often show itself as he called his commands to the crew. His dark pale eyes, filled with the seas of a hundred journeys, were only focused on one thing, a treasure only a few knew existed. Oi! Hoist that sail and set it westward! Haul up the anchor and secure it in its rightful hold! You there! Gather all them slaves, every last scurvy one, and set them to rowing! We be needing all the might we can muster to steer clear of the sandbars and cliffs! <laughs> Oh, the seas will be me dancing partner yet! Now conditions were getting more turbulent, with curtains of rain showering down as the crew went hither and thither, port to starboard fore and aft, frantically fulfilling the captain's commands. A rat had unwittingly approached Skarglar whilst he was in his element, temporarily breaking him out of his trance-like state. Captain, we haven't got enough riggings on the sails! The ropes keep snapping and tearing in the sea cloth. We be sinking tonight for sure in the raging <laughs> Well, why don't you get back there with some rope in your paws and get it re strong? Use your bloody tail if you must! But I be keeping her afloat even if I have to fight the very heavens myself! You'll see! <sighs> Aye, Captain. The spray of the seas out ahead soaked every part of the ship and its crew. What didn't help was that the wind would push the wet, often cold mist to even the most undesirable of places. Brian was used to sailing in his previous life as a shipwright, but nothing like this. However, he still pulled on the anchor rope with other slaves as they brought the heavy iron out of the sea to its resting position. They all chanted in unison, a 
a rhythmic poem of effort as they pulled on the coarse, rough rope. At long last, the anchor clunked into place, causing the other enslaved creatures to scatter in haste, striving to comply with the captain's directives. However, Brian harbored a different plan within his resourceful mind. Recognizing that much of the crew would be preoccupied with keeping the ship afloat, he surmised that the absence of one inconspicuous slave would likely go unnoticed. Instead of heading toward the rowing benches below deck as expected, he cunningly charted a course toward the cabin nestled deep within the ship's belly, driven by the desire to procure additional sustenance for his newfound companion locked away in the storeroom. Ensuring his hood remained raised, he stealthily maneuvered across the deck with purpose, deftly evading his disoriented fellow slave mates who were buffeted by the tempestuous waves which relentlessly jostled the vessel in every conceivable direction. A quick glance over his shoulder confirmed that no prying eyes bore witness to his actions. Satisfied, he inadvertently neglected to look ahead, failing to anticipate the sea rat who unwittingly crossed his path. With an abrupt collision, Brian found himself unceremoniously seated upon his rump, emitting a grunt of surprise. However, fortune favored Brian, for the sea rat had not yet seen him. The rat had found himself partway through the door when the smaller creature had rushed into him. With a whiny tone of frustration and crudeness, he took a step out of the cabin and began to voice his rage indignantly. Oi! I be fixing a card of a fresh hole in the scurry of rat hole there and shoved me! Brian prepared for the worst, when suddenly an otter stepped out between him and the rat. Sorry, matey, I didn't see you standing there. His gravelly baritone voice called, almost apologetically. The otter who made himself the heir of blame was an impressive sight to behold, emanating strength and fortitude. His form was robust. His patchy fur was crusted with sea salt and colored like snow-capped mountains. His tunic was ill-fitted, purposefully sliced down the middle to accommodate his muscular, furry, yet scarred chest. A rope was affixed to his ankle, trailing toward the central mast. Marking his body were numerous scars, a testament to past trials. Yet remarkably, both his eyes, orbs of a sea-blue color, remained intact. Alas, the rat he engaged with did not share such fortune. A patch concealed his right eye, bearing witness to its loss, while his body displayed fewer scars. Though appearing young and inexperienced, his audacious demeanor mingled with impudence. Physically diminutive and lacking the otter's might, he nonetheless posed a threat with unwavering determination. Don't you dare say sorry to me, you slave! Oi! Then what are you doing here? Pull your hide to the mast and get him sails by that! He'll self fashion your skin into a cheap round me neck! As the rat stepped away from the cabin, he turned his head up as if expecting to be treated as royalty, and sniffed rudely as he passed the otter. But he didn't notice Brian hiding behind. Oh, thanks, mate. I'll repay you your kindness, taking the blame like that. Brian said, offering a paw. But the otter refused, looking him up and down with a stern eye before speaking. He observed the meager gray and brown colored mouse's well-worn but recognizable oversized white tunic, his blue hooded vest, and the vibrant red scarf tied around his nape, the garments of a modest sailor. Looking hard into Brian's eyes, the otter saw in his glossy orbs of yellow-green an air of honesty and justice. Whatever you're doing in there, I want in. I don't care if it's food or whatever it is you're after. Count me as your shipmate. I feel like causing some strife for that cruel beast after what he's done. Ugh. I don't have much time, see? I'll repay you when we meet again, after my plan is finished, right? Brian said as he held out his paw more desperately now. I think you owe me a life. The least I want is to be part of your plan, matey. 
do we have a deal? He asked, this time with his own paw stretched out for a shake, the deal seeming to be an unavoidable one. Brian gave a moment of thought, his mind racing to incorporate this change in plans, before finally shaking his new shipmate's webbed paw. Deal. Brian took lead in scouting out the vacant cabin, being the better scavenger of the two, whilst the much tougher-looking otter guarded the entrance. As Brian entered, the door emitted a squeak just barely audible over the commotion of the crew outside. The door remained partially ajar thanks to the otter's sturdy footpaw jamming it as Brian began his investigation, just in such a case that an early trouble would foil their plan. As Brian stepped inside, he observed that the room wasn't too big, and none the cleaner either. It was filled with old empty bottles of wine and seaweed spirits, empty crustacean shells building a pile on the far side of the room, and an old rusted straight sword stuffed in the corner. A hammock swayed gently from above, a bed of woven ropes that provided a decent resting place to rest one's head Its tattered quilt, sewn from remnants of sails, messily covered it. The air inside was laced with the scent of aged wood, dampness, and the tang of old wine. In the center stood a sturdy weathered desk, roughened through use and laden with scattered old maps and navigational tools. After a brief survey, Brian's eyes alighted upon a plate holding meager food remnants accompanied by half a bottle of wine. With little else readily available, he swiftly gathered his findings and tucked them away within the recesses of his hood, ensuring their concealment. Driven by curiosity and resourcefulness, he delved deeper into the cabin's depths. Yet, as he ventured further, a tap on his shoulder warned that perhaps something may be going amiss. Right. I've almost searched everything. He called back in a hushed tone as he continued searching the desk where the mighty Viking would leisure himself. Suddenly, a small glint of a shiny, decorated yet smooth, silvery object caught Brian's eye. It captivated his attention as its small, half-round form seemed to tilt and rock on the desktop surface, along with the movements of the ship's swaying. Shaped like an open clamshell, it wasn't something Brian immediately recognized. Staring harder into its exposed secrets, he observed as two floating needles pointed in two different directions independently of each other and of the ship's heading. He went to snatch it for later observation, when suddenly he was yanked out of the cabin by force, his paw missing it by merely a breath hair but he managed to snatch a silver butter knife instead. The otter grabbed Brian and effortlessly slung him over his shoulder and out of the cabin. They slipped into a corner behind the stairs that led to the wheelhouse, where Brian fought his way down before brandishing the silver kitchen utensil he snagged. With a frustrated tone, he aimed it at the otter as he spoke. What you go and do that for? I told you I was almost done. Best be careful with that stub, Mouse, lest you want a bigger one in your back. Look. The otter warned as he pointed toward the cabin that Skoglar had now entered. Brian, now understanding the situation better, gave a sigh of relief as he put his weapon away. The both of them could hear Skoglar cursing and yelling at the rats that had accompanied him, complaining about the missing bottle of wine. In his rage-filled wrath, he chastised a few of them, throwing objects of various different weights and hefts at them, with most of the ship able to hear the commotion. (laughs) Flying squirrels, I'd hate to be one of them rats. I'd be having them out of the plank if I ever got the chance. The otter jested quietly, with a mischievous grin painted on his visage. Goodness, I'd say. A good bath would fix him up right. Say... What was it that caught your eye anyway, matey? Maybe another time, friend. I will need to get back in there to get it, though. So, I guess you're now part of my crew. Here. Brian said, as he offered part of the spoils. Oh, and what's your name, mate? 
The otter took the wine from Brian and began to suck it into his belly with just a few large gulps, only answering the mouse again after the bottle was empty. Ah, I'm Rotburn, the finest sailor on the seas, or at least I was before I was made a dumbfounded slave for that cruel scoglar. As he answered, Rotburn lifted his right footpaw, hinting at the ropes that bound his ankle only ten paces away from the center mast, keeping him trapped on the ship. Right. I'm Brian. After their introductions, Brian and Ropeburn watched as the same rat prior approached the cabin to address Skaglar about a matter. Pausing in front of the door, he gathered the courage to make his report. The unfortunate rat was flattened between the door and the wall of the cabin when Skaglar had suddenly come bursting through the entranceway, totally unaware of the squashed rat's presence. Madly, he turned his attention to one of the other horde rats to vent his rage. Some scurvy mate stole me precious elderberry wine! When I discover the scoundrel, I'll send him down to the depths of the seas and back! And as for that scallywax carcass, it'll make fine fish bait! Mark me words! The two troublemakers, hidden from Skarglar's sight, watched on and gave a quiet chuckle each at the antics of the maddened marmot. We'd best get to the rolling benches if we want to keep our fur. Let's meet at the storeroom when we dock again. Good luck to you, Roburn. Aye, the same to you, Brian. The two shook paws and quickly parted ways to their respective responsibilities each. Brian could still hear the trouble Skarglar was handing out to the unfortunate crewmates, just paces off his tail as he jammed through the crews and back to his bench. He cut in front of the other slaves as he found his spot, clasped himself to the chains, and started rowing. One slave beside him smelled the scrap of food remnant Brian had hidden in his hood. He was a vole, a skinny, older thing with a half-mouth of crooked teeth, an old burlap potato sack that was more air than tunic, and a shifty look about him. Share me some of that food, buddy, and maybe I want you to put the top of me breath about your little tit. He threatened under his breath. Why are you going off about meat? See, I was needed to pull on the anchor. Besides, I don't have anything to give you. The slave drew in a chest full of air, ready to belt out, make a commotion, and destroy Brian's cover. All right, all right, meat. I'll give you your share. Just keep tight lips about you. Brian gave a quick glance to his surroundings, then satisfied that no one was watching, he reached around and grabbed a small chunk off the scrap from his hood and handed it to the greedy-eyed vole beside him. The slave greedily ate it in one full bite, swallowed hard, and gave a groan of satisfaction before whispering again. Thanks, mighty. Keep that coming. It may help so keep me mouth shut. Brian gave an exasperated sigh as he pulled on the oar, knowing that this would make things more difficult for him. As if perfectly timed, a slam came from the wooden trap door that led up deck, bringing Skarglar to a near disgraceful crash into the wooden floorboards. He was just narrowly able to regain his footing as the guards following close by snickered behind his back. Poising himself in a nearly graceful manner as if nothing had happened, he heard the snorting and shot back a look of contempt. With it followed a chilled silence as he brought his gaze to the slaves of the rowing decks. Fixing his focus on rowing, Brian heard a gurgle from beside him. In one swift motion, his paw slapped over his rowing companion's mouth, realizing that he was about to release a mighty belch that would surely spell their doom. The vole stared at him rudely, but Brian gave a gesture of a quiet nature. Then, nodding his head in the direction of Skarglar's whereabouts, he whispered too low for the marmot's ear to detect. Shh. Tight lips, remember? The vole gave a regretful sigh as his features slouched grumpily. Then, with a good swallow, he evacuated the belch from his gullet. Not seeing anything unusual, Skarglar gave a tumultuous speech, venting his undignified rage at the whole of the unsightly paddling slaves. Avast, me hearties! Keep them back, Sir Rowan! 
No sleep until we get to open waters, you yellow livered squelches! Oh, and if I catch the greedy little chum who dares sneak into my cabin, I'll make certain that you have the tail ripped out of you as you hang from the mast! With that, he left through the trap door and took his departure back up deck to command the crew again, leaving the slaves to their pitiful back-breaking chore. In a heavy sigh of relief, Brian pulled on the oar, his mind numbed by the laborious task of pulling the very seas themselves under the ship, the heavy wooden oars as his utensil. Time ebbed away as his eyes drooped shut halfway, and he began to snore. With a quick jab of the elbow, his rowing companion woke the weary Brian from his slumber, returning the manner that the mouse had used earlier. No sleep until open waters, member matey. Right. Turning his mind back to the thoughts of his own family, his beautiful wife Lilac, and his daughters Rosalind and Runa, Brian put an added determination into his effort. I will escape this blasted ship and find you both. By the fur, I swear it. Morning had risen the sun over the horizon of the Vermorian plains, bringing with it the songs of early morning birds and the scent of a new day. Most woodland creatures were starting to awaken now to begin their mornings, but there was one who was up even before the sun, a loyal mousewife and mother, washing the dishes while she hummed a quiet tune from her memory. From her vantage point at the wash bucket, she watched as the sun began to tickle the snout of her unconscious dear friend lying on the bed, hoping that today might be the day she will awake. As consciousness trickled back into her senses, Lilac pondered upon the serene stillness that had enveloped her surroundings, a realm that exuded tranquility, yet was tinged with an obscure essence. The whole lot to her seemed muddy or washed out, like a deep, murky pond she could only see blotched hues of yellow and red, but at least it was warm. Her eyes remaining closed, she gave a quick sneeze from the sunlight that tickled her nose, letting a painful groan escape after. Am I dead? Is this what Dark Forest feels like? Lilac mumbled to herself, not expecting to hear a reply. By the sounds of it, no. You're beginning to wake up. Hang on, I'm just finishing the dishes. A familiar voice answered, much to Lilac's surprise. <gasps> Harriet, is that you? Lilac slurred painfully, her eyelids weighing heavily like wet sheets on a clothesline. Hi, sweetie, I'm here. Oh, oh. Everything hurts. There was a splash and a clatter of dishes being put away, followed by some soft footsteps on wooden floorboards as Harriet's voice approached. I know, honey. Your back seems injured, so I've had you lying on your front to help. The little mouse mom explained as she dried her paws on a cleaning towel. Lilac tried to open her eyes in order to decide where she really was, if not Dark Forest. No sooner than they opened did her eyelids clamor shut, the sun reaching the depth of her glossy mint-colored orbs, stinging them painfully. She tried retracing her steps to remember what had happened, but most of it was a blur. Suddenly, she sprang up, eyes wide as a recent memory violently played back in her mind. Is Runa, Rosalind, and, and Brian all right? Oh, please tell me they are. Oh, ow! Harriet dabbed the cool cleaning cloth on Lilac's forehead as she tried to calm her and get her resting again. There, there, Lilac. Calm yourself. Your back was hit harder than the lunch bell in full harvest. <laughs> We found Rosalind hiding in some bush on the trail here. 
but we haven't yet found Runa or Brian. But they must be out there somewhere. Lila groaned painfully as she let herself lie on her stomach again, keeping herself arched up a little to talk to Harriet. Oh, Ooh. that's what I'm worried about. The same vermin who did this to me could be out there looking for them. Wait, however did you find me? I thought after that big brute hit me with the pot, I was as good as dead. From my memory, we were running late to your picnic. But when we had got there, your poor house smelt of burning chestnuts. When we went into it to investigate, we found you lying on the floor, close to Dark Forest's gates. Dilly saw you breathing still and suggested we take you home. You've been resting here, and we've been looking after you ever since. You were out for a good four days. Four days? Oh, Brian and Runa would be as good as dead without someone to look after them. Lila cried out, pushing herself up and nearly out of the bed. Harriet could see the tears that were building in her eyes as Lila crashed and sucked into the pillow, holding it like a big teddy bear in her arms, her face scrunched in sorrow as everything began to sink in. I'm never going to see them again, am I? Oh, honey. Ryan was a shipwright, remember? He would sail all around the world to find you again, you lucky treasure you. And Runa is a tough little one. She has the spirit of a burning flame, that one. They are strong enough to take care of themselves. I know that we'll see them again, even if we must search for them ourselves. So, let's go searching for them now. Oh, oh. Not until you've healed some. I'll take care of you until you're able to walk on your own two paws again. Lilac thought a moment at the remark. I know you will, and there's nothing I can do to stop that, is there? Harriet shook her head, with a worried yet motherly expression on her features. Lilac gave a sigh in return before she broke eye contact and rested her head on her arms out in front of her. Lilac seemed to calm a little as she let her thoughts out. I'm just worried, Harriet. I'm worried to the end of my whiskers about them. They are the only family I have, and I'm troubled that I won't see them again. I hope they are both all right. I hope so too, sweetie. But one thing at a time. 